As many in America and here in Chicago seek new awareness about race, we here at NBC5 are beginning a new ongoing series of reports. They're called Race in Chicago. We begin tonight with a brief overview on how race has shaped so much in our lives throughout history and into today. My house was the first one, and then we bought the Inca property uh, a year later. Aisha Butler, a homeowner in Englewood, is sadly an anomaly. She's working with folks in her community to help them buy houses, but she says most find it nearly impossible. It was so many hurdles that they had to go through to purchase a home that they just gave up. Those folks were not alone. A WBZ and City Bureau analysis of six years of lending by major banks in Chicago showed for every one dollar banks lent in majority white areas, they lent just 12 cents in black areas like Inglewood. It laid bare here in Chicago just how dramatic the uh, disparity is. These lending practices would make you believe that redlining was still a real thing. Redlining was a government practice that classified black neighborhoods as high risk for mortgage lenders. And as Nicole Hannah-Jones puts it in her article, It's Time for Reparations, from 1934 to 1962, a 28-year period, quote, 98% of the Federal Housing Administration loans went to white Americans. Lowry argues the effect of that policy is still being felt today. People may not at least overtly be saying, oh, you're black, so we're not going to lend to you. But the fact is those communities are so disadvantaged from that discriminatory lending from so many years ago that nowadays they don't really have to. Let's take a further step back. Disadvantaged treatment of African-Americans began with slavery. Slavery, often called America's original sin, lasted almost 250 years. There was a sense of shame around it. The book River of Blood brings us images and experiences of the last living formerly enslaved people in the 1930s. Willie Williams talks of his master using one enslaved man to stud and evaluating children by how much money they might bring. Brutal punishments, sexual abuse, separation of families, none of these things aligned with the best ideals of the United States. And laws and policies enacted after slavery ended helped perpetuate the oppression and abuse that blacks suffered, like black codes, laws that made it illegal to be unemployed. And once arrested, a black person could be forced into labor in ways that included convict leasing, a practice author Douglas Blackman outlines in his book, Slavery by Another Name, a practice he says continued into the 1940s. A new system of involuntary servitude comes into existence it doesn't look much different from the way that slavery looked before the Civil War. In fact, Blackman says U.S. Steel, which opened its Gary, Indiana plan in 1908, at the same time was buying convict labor for an Alabama mine it bought in 1907. Workers, while they were under the control of U.S. Steel, received very little food, no medical care. Dozens of people were killed in accidents. These were places that looked more like German death camps. U.S. Steel tells us it inherited the use of convict labor with the mine it bought in 1907, ended it within four years, and advocated against it after that. And while the 14th Amendment granted the formerly enslaved person citizenship and the 15th Amendment allowed black men to vote, the rights and privileges of the Constitution bypassed African Americans through the Jim Crow laws that enforced segregation and voter suppression. Laws and tactics like literacy tests, poll taxes, and domestic terrorism. Many people are lynched because either they wanted to vote, they were too outspoken, or um, for economic reasons. The Equal Justice Initiative puts the number lynched from 1877 to 1950 at 4,400 souls, 800 of which are memorialized here. And though poll taxes and literacy tests were outlawed in the 1960s, accusations of voter suppression persist to this day. It's trauma attached to it, of just being black. It's like trauma. There is still a need to address the ways in which, if that oppression had not been there, what would black people have been? If you'd like to dig deeper into these subjects, we have links to the articles and books referenced in the report. Just go to our website, NBCChicago.com, or to the NBC Chicago app. Next week, Rob Stafford will review one man's experience with the juvenile justice system.